undergraduate researcher here at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I'm currently working in the chemistry department under Javier Vita Alamis, Craig Hawker, and specifically their graduate student, Allison Abdul. And I'm here to talk to you guys today about my research in aggregation and emission in fluorescent chemical polymers. So I wanted to start out by going over the idea of aggregation induced emission. So this is the idea that we take a fluorescent substance, get it down into its aggregate form, basically this like solid clumpy state, and it starts a fluorescent light. And what's really cool about this is that depending on the environment, we can kind of get like a gradient of fluorescence, and it's a reversible process, so we can go from emission to non-emission. But this doesn't really happen on its own. We have to apply a stimulus. And this stimulus can come in various forms. I have two examples, but there are many. One is pressure, where we like physically grind down our fluorescent substance and get it into its aggregate form. And the other is more like melting it down. And with various stimuli comes various applications. I have two examples of AIE applications here. One is in bioimaging, where um, a group in Florida, at the University of Florida, um, actually took AIE units, tacked it onto peptides, and injected this um, bacteria to make it fluoresce. Um, but something that's more, a little more applicable to my research would be um, using AIE for logic gates, which I'll go into more detail in the next slide. But understanding AIE on a molecular level, so what's happening here is that we have this fluorescent molecule, and when we give it, when we apply a stimulus, we're basically giving it energy, and this energy has to be translated somehow. And so here, this molecule is free to rotate, maybe it's in solution, and so the energy is going into the rotation of the molecule. But once we start packing this down into the solid state, the, um, the energy that's going into it is forced to be translated and to light. Um, and so, um, what we can do with this system is that we can create something known as a logic gate. And these are two very basic logic gates, the not and yes logic gate. Basically, um, we have an input of zero and it um, gives an inverse output of one, or you know, um, yes, like more corresponds to it. Um, and we can kind of assign these emission and non-emission properties um, as ones and zeros. But um, to create this kind of system, we need to be able to t um, easily turn it on and off. And the way we do that is tacking on these, um, these like, AIE molecules onto a polymer. So polymers are basically these like, long chains of molecules. And what we do is we tack on these AI units to these long chains. We apply our temperature stimulus, and our chains start to spontaneously coil creating this very like spring-like structure and forcing our AI units to stack on top of each other. Our unit um, that we choose for our research is known as tetrafenylethylene, TPE, and the way we incorporate this into a polymer is we create this monomer building block, basically these Legos that we can like start like tacking onto or, you know, building. And there's three parts to our monomer. There's our AIE active unit, our spacer, and our polymerizable head group. And after this monomer is synthesized, we can polymerize it, creating this material with fluorescent properties. Um, you can kind of imagine this like repeating over and over again and kind of corresponding to this like long scheme here. Moving forward into my actual summer goals. Um, so I have three. And the first has a lot to do with my development as like a new researcher in the lab, and that would be synthesizing my monomer building block. And following this step, we actually um, aim to find a optimal storage condition. And finally, exploring the emission prop. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So we do this by exploring. Uh, gases that we get stored in, the multiple solvents, whether or not it's in dark or light. Um, and finally, we uh, aim to explore the emissive properties of my polymer. So I'll start out with this first goal here. 
Um, and I wanted to show you guys kind of my general reaction setup for these reactions. Um, I think this is a really important part of just research in general because every time I do go into lab and do want to set up a reaction, I have to bring these components together and like create this viable system for my reaction to be successful. So to go over the details, we have a water condenser here so that everything that comes up can get cooled and come back down into the reaction. We have septa to close off our system, a round bottom flask, basically a good rule of thumb for that is you want a round bottom two times the size of the contents inside. Um, we have our reaction here, stir bar, and we run our reactions in argon gas so that no O2 from the atmosphere can react with anything. And moving forward into our actual synthesis, we start by tacking on our spacer. This is done at 100 degrees Celsius, around 16 hours so overnight, generally. Um, and following this reaction, I calculated a percent yield of 61%. Um, in my opinion, that's pretty good. Anything over 50% is <laughs> successful. <laughs> um, and following this reaction, we tack on our polymerizable heifer. This is done at room temperature for around 12 hours, and I calculated a percent yield of 56%. And moving forward into my goals, the second step was to find an optimal storage condition. And we did this um, because of something known as autopolymerization. We do not want our monomer to autopolymerize. And so what this is, what autopolymerization is, is when our monomer is like sitting on a bench somewhere when we're not using it, it starts to react with itself due to its conditions that it's stored in. Um, and this is really annoying because it starts creating polymers with different lengths. They're not linear polymers. They start to branch out. Um, and basically, after our monomer autopolymerizes, we cannot use it for our own controlled polymerizations. So what we did is we, create, um, we ran the storage study, created all these different situations in which our monomer can be in. Um, and it was actually pretty successful. All across the board, we got 0% autopolymerization. So according to this study, I should be able to put my monomer in any of these situations, and it shouldn't autopolymerize. And after this, um, after running this study, we decided that this would be the best um, ideal storage choice um, in which we can like store our monomer for long periods of time. Um, these two were my project achievements for the summer. This is what I actually got through. I can now run these reactions, purify and characterize all with confidence, all within like <laughs> seven days as opposed to like a month and a half. <laughs> um, and we did indeed find optimal storage conditions. Um, but going, moving forward, and I wanted to talk about my last research goal, the one that we did not get to, I kind of wanted to go through small details of that. Um, so what we're doing next is we're taking our monomer, we're polymerizing it, and we're gonna see, like apply stigmas, and we're gonna see if it does indeed light up. And when we do this, we will, if it does, hopefully, um, <laughs> we'll be exploring um, the wavelengths, absorption, and maybe different stimuli in which we'll make this happen. And after all this is done, we can start branching out a little more and changing our system and changing our polymer. And the way we do that is changing this guy, our building block, and changing the different components of it. So what we will do is start out with the polymerized head group. Maybe we'll take off this methyl group here and use something like this, or use something completely different for a head group. Um, we can change the size of the spacer. We can make it longer or shorter. And what we do here um, what this would change, actually, is the distance between our fluorophore here and the polymer chain. And we're actually really interested to see what happens here, because that's going to determine like, like whether or not this is like strictly like to the polymer, or like if it, if it has more room to like move, you know, maybe it will like stack a little better. Mm -hmm. It's something we're super interested in. We can change our floor for completely and maybe explore different colors of light and different wavelengths, you know? <laughs> um, anyway. Um, and I just wanted 
give a shout out to my faculty advisors, to my mentor. She's helped me so much and taught me so much, and I've had a great experience this summer, you guys. I wanted to thank Sammy and Tanit and Simone and everybody, all like my peers, um, my friends that have heard me give science spiels <laughs> on, on those Saturday nights, you know. I just, it's really great. <laughs> thank you.